they're not fine. But they're good now so you can hear Matt at 10 o'clock. We're really excited about that. It's good to, uh, it's good to be with you all. It's good to uh, be back this year. And I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to share um, with you all. And uh, Ed mentioned uh, our family and, and being part of uh, the work in uh, Beaver Creek as well as uh, in Cincinnati. So I'll make a shameless plug. If you're in that greater Cincinnati metro area, let's, let's connect before, uh, before it's over. Um, there's a great opportunity for us, I think, in Cincinnati. And so um, we're looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us there. If I, there's a 50-50 chance uh, that I get to preach twice today. And you say, well, how is that? And you say, well, it might be the first time and the last time. <laughs> Sadly, it wouldn't be the first time that's happened to me. Um, but I am, familiar, I am familiar with having that experience. And it really, like preaching two and one is kind of the same, right? First time and the last time. And so, uh, but it's good to be here and glad that we can all gather around God's word rightly divided. I, it asks for message titles, and I'm really not very good at that. And, uh, and so I came up with something that I thought was fairly simple um, that I couldn't mess up. And so um, we're going to talk a little bit about accounting for grace. You know, I loved something that Ed said last night, which was, uh, you know, we're here With the full, with the confidence of Christ, right? Uh, many of us are here, even though we're at different um, levels in our understanding of God's word, rightly divided. Um, we all have uh, some understanding of the chart and of what God is doing in this age differently uh, than in prior ages or ages to come. The one thing that we do know too is that the whole Bible is about Jesus Christ. And that is something that uh, is important, I think, for us as grace believers to always remember is that the whole Bible is about him. And so everything points to him and his work and who he is as the redeemer of Israel and the savior of humanity. And we know the Bible teaches us that God requires an accounting of sin. Right? When you think about accounting for grace, God requires an accounting of sin. Of sin, and we know Romans six twenty three tells us that the wages of sin is death, and we know also that there's an accounting of the works of man. Romans fourteen twelve right says every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. And we're also taught there's a judgment to come, right? John chapter nine, in verse thirty nine, Jesus said, "For judgment, I am come." into this world and so we know there's judgment we know revelation 20 teaches us about that great white throne judgment where all the unsaved are going to gather and be uh, judged according to their works the scripture teaches us about uh, our guilt before god that we're guilty of sin mankind guilty of sin guilty of depravity guilty most importantly of unbelief, right? And if you go spend any time in, in Romans, I think you see, uh, from my study, you see in Romans, the first part of Romans, you really see God declaring all of mankind guilty, right? Everybody, like everybody, we kind of talk a lot of oftentimes about Romans chapter one and the depravity of, uh, of, of the Gentile, just of humanity. And then Romans chapter two, Paul declares the Jew guilty before God. And then in Romans chapter three, uh, verse 19 declares the whole world guilty before God. And so we know that we're all have at one point before we were saved guilty before God. And so turn, um, I know from last night that you know where Philemon is, right? So you have that, uh, you have that going for you. So turn to Philemon. I'm, I'm kind of launching off from, uh, from uh, Paul's letter to Philemon as well. And... Uh, like most of you, I love, I love the, uh, Paul's letter to Philemon. But you're there 
in Philemon, and you can pick whichever chapter you want, as Ted said last night. But uh, we're going to start reading in verse 8. And so Paul says, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in times past, uh, time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. You know, time past, right, if we, if we think about what God, how God was dealing with mankind in time past, uh, the law provided an intricate uh, and very specific system of offerings to atone for sin. And if you don't understand um, how all that works, you can spend uh, as much or as little time as you want uh, learning about that. And you find out, like if you do any study back in the Old Testament, that like even in Leviticus 4, there is instruction uh, for how to atone uh, for sins committed in ignorance, right? And so... Uh, whether you did it on purpose, whether you did it ignorantly, uh, you know, obviously we all know that there was the, uh, the whole economic uh, component to that, like depending on your economic status, what kind of offering it was that you presented. Uh, but the Jews back there in that age had to give an account of their actions and atone for their sin. And so they had to uh, come before the priest and they had to say, hey, based on uh, what I've done, uh, the the uh, the penalty or the atonement um, is prescribed, and then I've got to go do what that is. And so, based on my economic status, I might have to bring a lamb. I might have to bring uh, some turtle doves. I might have to bring just whatever I can find uh, out and about uh, in in the uh, in the field, if you will. And so, there were lots of uh, very prescriptive things that folks have had to do to give an account of their life. And we see that continue. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. This is a, an account of the same type of accounting that had to be made. Look at verse 14, Matthew chapter 25. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. Now look at verse 24. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast, that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then in my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Now, I know that we've, I'm sure that we've all heard this account, right, of, uh, of the talents and what people went and did with the things that the Lord had given them. 
but we learn something about this fellow that had one talent, right? And that's that he didn't even do, uh, you know, the, 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 his Lord comes back and says, you know, gives, says, hey, I wanted you to give an accounting of what you've done uh, with what I've given you. And the one that had five said, okay, I, got f- I had five, I turned it in, I doubled it, I turned it into ten. The one that t- said two did something with it. The one with one, as we read, said, I was afraid. I didn't do anything with what you gave me. I just buried it in the ground, and look, here it is, isn't it great? And what, is it, what, does, uh, what does his Lord say? At the very least, you could have put it in the bank and got some interest. But you didn't even do that. And so we see this accounting of the use of those talents. And so um, in much the same way, uh, Philemon really gives us that same accounting of Onesimus who is facing a day of reckoning. Give an account, giving an account of his decisions. When I think about Onesimus, I think about the day that he uh, fled from the bonds of Philemon's slavery. You know, no doubt he sang the song of freedom, right? And I think about that um, down in Cincinnati. We have the uh, National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. And uh, I've been there a few times, and uh, it's surreal to stand on the banks of the Ohio and think about everything that was transpiring there. And then you apply that uh, to Onesimus and Philemon, and we know that Onesimus was uh, in servitude to Philemon, and he ran away. And he had, as he fled, he was no doubt rejoicing, not knowing that while he was free from Onesimus, he was still enslaved to his sin. He was still enslaved and still in bondage. And Onesimus had not accounted for his confrontation with the gospel that he had to face uh, in the person in the uh, ministry of Paul. And so we see that Paul, if you go back to Philemon, we know that when Paul was ministering to Philemon when, or ministering to Onesimus, when he got saved, Paul was in prison, right? Paul was in bondage, but free. Onesimus was free, but still in bondage. That's why Paul says, if you're free, be free. If you're in bondage, be in bondage. Just live for Christ, no matter what you do. And so Onesimus had not accounted for that. And we see in Galatians where our real freedom is, right? I'm sure we've all got Galatians 5.1 highlighted in our Bible, right? That we're to stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. But while Onesimus, as I think about this epistle to Philemon, while Onesimus was still free in Christ, he still had a day of reckoning. He still had to give an account of his Escape. And so we, of course, find, if you go back to Philemon, we go back and pick up uh, in Philemon, we'll refresh uh, our minds in verse 10, right? We find out that Onesimus gotten saved, right? Verse 10, Paul says, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. And so Paul says, hey, Onesimus has come, he's gotten saved, I'm imprisoned, he came, he's ministered to me, and now he's being returned again to Philemon to give an account of his actions, right? And we know we have that same thing that we have to look forward to, and I say look forward to because it's something that's happening, not something that we're enjoying. Look at, uh, look at Romans 14 real fast. I know you know these scriptures, but it's good for us to see them for ourselves. Romans chapter 14, right? Look at verse 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. We're going to give an account. 2 Corinthians 5 says we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Right? And we know that. 
We know in, from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the, the gold, silver, the precious stones, the wood, hay, and stubble, our work's going to be made manifest, right? You say, man, it's kind of heavy for 9 o'clock. <laughs> I got it, right? I got it. But guess what? It, it's in there, right? And we shouldn't shy away from it. I know it's 9 o'clock, but it is, what's, it is what thus saith the word, right? That is going to happen. And so we know that that's going to take place. I'm going to tell you, when I look at, uh, when I look at 1 Corinthians 3, I'm, I rejoice in the fact that all that stuff is going to be burned up and not left behind to be put on display. That's the way I think about it. Right? So I see, I know all the parts of my life that are going to be wood, hay, and stubble. I'm like, Lord, I thank you that that is going to be vaporized. And the only thing that's left is good. And I know also that anything that's good belongs to him and not to me. So I'm feeling all right. I'm not great with it because it's 9 <laughs> o'clock. I got it. But I'm okay. Because any good thing... Every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord. And so any good thing that I've produced that would qualify as gold, silver, and precious stones belongs to him, Amen. not to me. And so I, it is what it is, and it's going to happen. But here is Onesimus in the same way going back to Philemon to face the music. Right? He's still accountable for all that. Right? And so he's headed back. And I think about uh, that relationship between Paul and and Onesimus, and Philemon. And for me, it is the most clear illustration of the gospel of grace in the scripture. That's what it is for me. And I think about Onesimus going back, right? So um, I, I, I'm kind of a, those of you that know, know me uh, well know that I'm kind of a, a mind's eye kind of guy. Like I love seeing, I love, I love bringing the word to life in my mind. And uh, just creating illustrations has probably helped me remember things, right? But I think about, you know, here's Paul, uh, here's Onesimus. Onesimus has gotten saved. He's helping Paul. Paul says, man, you've got to go back and make this thing right. You've got to go make it right. You, you, this thing, what, you've just got to fix it. And you've got to go back to Colossae and you've got to make it right. And he says, I'll write a letter. But you've got to go. And I think about the journey that, uh, that Onesimus took and all of the things that were in his mind and in his heart. Right? Because he's going back to face it. Right? He's going back to face it. He is, he is free in Christ, but he has this thing that he's got to fix. And I'm going to tell you, it had to be a long journey uh, for on Onesimus, uh, really contemplating the consequences of his actions, right? Because you and I have all faced things in our own lives that we really don't know how folks are going to react to, right? We're, ho we're hoping for the best, but you just don't know. And I think that was probably um, part of Onesimus' uh, thought process uh, as he thought about that, you know, knowing that uh, he'd been an unprofitable servant. He had fled. He's returning to Philemon, really to face a righteous judge. And Onesimus is deserving of a just reward for his escape. Right? And you say, yeah, but he's saved and everything's great. His eternity is secure. But he's got to deal with the here and now. He's still in dealing, going to have to deal with Philemon who has righteous judgment. But I would say that there was uh, one thing that Onesimus had not uh, necessarily taken into account. Hopefully you're still there. Look at verse 15. Philemon, verse 15. Paul writes to Philemon. You know, one thing we won't know till we get to heaven is whether... Onesimus knew the contents of the letter. Right? I don't know. Did he know what was in the letter or did he not know? Right? You know, you might say, well, you could, you could argue that Onesimus wrote the letter, actually, like, scribed the letter. Maybe. 
Maybe he didn't know what was in the letter. Maybe he didn't know till he uh, got to uh, the front porch there and knocked on the door and handed Philemon a letter. Look at verse 15. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. And so Paul's admonition to Philemon is, you treat him like you would treat me. You do for him as you would do for me. However you would deal with this matter if it was me, deal with this matter with Onesimus in that way. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Turn to Romans chapter 3. I mentioned a moment ago that for me, uh, the, the epistle of Philemon is the most, um, is the clearest picture of God's grace and the gospel of grace in action for me. Romans chapter 3, look at verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. What do we learn from Romans chapter 3? We learn from Romans chapter 3 that Jesus Christ took our place and, and serves a propitiation for our sins. He did that in our place. As Paul said to Philemon of Onesimus, whatever you would do to him, you do to me. That's what Christ said for us. That is the declaration that Jesus Christ made to God the Father on your behalf and on mine which is whatever they deserve, whatever he deserves, you do that to me, right? Verse 25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness. We are justified freely by our works, right? Okay, guess what? I ask because it's 9 o'clock. We're not justified by our works, right? Verse 24 says we're justified freely by his grace. Right? And so we have this picture in Philemon because that is what Christ did for us. Opening the door of grace and intervening on our behalf. Right? That's what he did. That's why we're here this morning. Right? We're basically here representing the yellow part of the chart. That This is us. Right? If, if not for the yellow part, there's no reason for us to be here. Right? Because the Bible says what? At that time we were without hope. Right? Without Christ. Without anything. And so without the yellow, uh, without the yellow section of this chart, there's really no purpose. Right? And so here we are, knowing that Christ intervened on our behalf and said, hold on, let me do something to deal with that, and I will take it. I will be the propitiation for sin, and they can freely uh, have my just righteousness. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to tell you, when justice called, mercy answered. I'm glad for that. I'm glad that there is a, there, while there is an accounting to be made, I'm glad that Jesus Christ has taken the ledger to do the accounting on my behalf. Right? What, is, what have we learned in 1 Timothy chapter 2? Right? There's one mediator between God and man. And who is that? Between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Right? And so when I am facing and I have to account for myself to God, what does Jesus Christ say? Hold on. I got this. Right? When God the Father says, hey, worthy of a guilty 
Guilty, guilty. What does Christ come along and say? Worthy, worthy, worthy. Right? Not in, not in himself, in me. Don't look at him. You look at me. Right? Don't look at anything else. You look at me. Right? And that is what, uh, that is the uh, admonition that Christ gives to the Father when it comes to dealing with our uh, sin and dealing with our separation from him. Right? Colossians chapter 2. We all know what that says. Right? Uh, turn over there. It's, uh, I'll, well, let's just read it. I'll get rambling here in a minute, and I'll mess it up. So let's just read it so you don't think that I got something going on up here that I shouldn't. It is 9 o'clock. Colossians chapter 2. Look at verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Doing what? Verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Right? And so what did Christ do? Took everything that was on the ledger against me, took it out of the way. Right? Now, I would tell you that as far as I'm concerned, verse 14 references the law. Right? That was the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. But you know what he did? He took it out of the way. And how, how do we know sin? Because of the law. Right? And so he took everything that was wrong with me and took it out of the way. Because we wouldn't know it was wrong if we didn't have the law to tell us. Right? And so here we are, knowing we're guilty before God, and Jesus Christ says, hey, I'm going to take care of that. I'm going to take it out of the way. Right? I'm going to nail it to my cross, and I will take care of it. That's why Romans 5 says what? Christ died for us. Hallelujah. Right? Why? why when? When we got good enough, when we got deserving, when we came back and said, here's what I've done with the talent that you've given me. I've gone from five and I've multiplied it to ten. Is that when he died for us? No, we know what the scripture says. While we were yet without strength, right? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And thanks be unto God that he died for us knowing what he was doing right here. Knowing he was going to open a door for us as, uh, uh, as nothing, right? Gentile people. That he was going to do for us something that he had not done for anybody else. Which was say, whosoever will may come. Right? All the trouble, all, of the, all those things that I find myself guilty before God. And he says, I will take care of it. Right? As Onesimus stood there at, um, on Philemon's doorstep with Paul's letter and says, here's the letter. Right? I think about Philemon seeing Onesimus. And what was his reaction? What was his reaction? I think about what my reaction would be. Right? Would I be rejoicing that he's returned? Or would I be like, let's go. Because don't presume that Philemon knows that Onesimus has found Paul and has gotten saved. Right? Maybe. But what if he didn't? What if he just knows that here's Onesimus that's shown back up on his doorstep having run away? Right? And Onesimus hands Philemon that letter and says, this is from Paul. And he begins to read that letter. My son begotten in my bonds. If he oweth thee aught. Whatever it is, you treat him like you treat me. Was his heart, was his heart, was he enraged when he saw him? And did his heart soften as he read this epistle from Paul? Or was he in a different set of circumstances how did he really react I think about God's the father's reaction to me right in much the same way 
He's not even looking my way without Jesus Christ. And so here we are standing on the doorstep of heaven, right? Unworthy, undeserving, unqualified. Jesus Christ says what? I got this. He's with me. Whatever, if he oweth thee aught, he's with me. Whatever it is, he's with me. We have Christ to make an accounting for us so that we can declare his goodness and grace. Right? We have liberty in Christ because of what he did. That says, you know what? When I get down to the end, whatever... uh, There's not going to be any uh, fancy accounting practices to to clean up my mess, right? There's no fuzzy math that's going to take care of me. I've got a clean slate because of Jesus Christ. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I won't read all of this. You can go back and and read the rest for yourself. I think you'll be uh, okay uh, if we just read verse 19. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 19, he said, Yet in the church I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Paul said, I'd rather speak five words. Can I offer five words to you this morning? Turn back to Philemon. We'll end where we started. Let me offer you five words. Look with me at verse 18. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. If you can only get five words this morning, if you only get five words this weekend with understanding, may it be that you hear Jesus Christ declare to God the Father on your behalf, put that on mine account. Just five words with understanding will make all the difference. You know, Brother Ed, last night I talked about a fellow that said, I hope I'm going to heaven. And we know this morning that the Lord wants us to have the full assurance of faith Not hoping, not thinking, not wondering, but knowing beyond the shadow of a doubt that we're saved and that heaven's going to be our eternal home. And he wants us to understand that everything to be reconciled to God the Father to allow me to go to heaven is to be put on the account of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that he died so that we could live. Matter of fact, he said that he wanted us to have live life more abundantly because of what he did. The liberty that we have in him is accounted for because of the grace that he delivered on Calvary. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the time that we've had together in your word today. Thank you for all those that are here. Just ask you, Lord, that you would uh, be mindful of your word. Allow us to be mindful of it. Thank you for the work of Calvary. Thank you for everything that you've done for us. Thank you you've declared that we can put everything on your account. I ask you to just continue to bless our time together. May it be for your glory and honor, the edification of your people, and Lord, in all things, may you have the preeminence. And we'll thank you and praise you for it. Amen. Amen.